Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology term podcast. Everyone, welcome into the program. I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for today's show because not only do we have Ralph Bond, but we also have a slew of stories. Uh, a lot of them are really fun, a lot of robotics and, you know, uh, just really, really fun stories that you're probably not going to pick up elsewhere. So, hey, if you want to find out more, you can check out ComputerAmerica.com. That's where all the links will be. Ralph does a an amazing job putting together the show notes that we have posted. And, of course, we're going to have uh, or we have a corner uh, completely dedicated to Ralph. Definitely a tag. And uh, everyone, hey, ComputerAmerica.com, that's all you need to remember. It will be right there by the time you hear this, of course. So with uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and bring Ralph on and, uh, you know, hey, we'll just have fun with it. We have uh, four amazing stories. And of course, he has been a longtime Computer America contributor and has uh, transformed uh, into our science and technology trends correspondent, which is a role that really covers, you know, anything that science and technology touches, which uh, in today's day and age, there's really not much it doesn't. So it's a very uh, hodgepodge, potpourri kind of segment. But hey, it's, you know, we like that. So welcome back onto the program. Ralph, how you been? Oh, great. It's great to be back. And I'll tell you what, another thing to stress to our visitors, if they're new, this is an opportunity to walk away feeling better about the world. We're not going to do downer negative news. That's plenty of that's out there already. We're <laughs> going to talk about great advancements in science and technology that are all positive and really give us a great way to look forward to the future instead of dreading it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, and, and of course, uh, if you want to, you know, tell them a little bit more about, you know, kind of what we aim to do on our segment uh, sure. here. Yeah, yeah. What Ben and I do every Friday, usually, is uh, look for where we're headed, and that's the trends part of it, in robotics, medical technology, sustainable energy technology, transportation advances, space research, physics, you name it, everything's available for us to take a look at if it's positive and leading to a better future. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and once again, ComputerAmerica.com, we know that uh, a lot of people listen to this, you know, uh, when they're driving or when they're doing something else, uh, you know, podcasts are rarely, uh, you know, sit in front of your TV and just focus on that. But uh, <laughs> hey, you know, if you want, uh, if you want Cliff Notes, he has them for you. Again, ComputerAmerica.com. And of course, if you're watching the video portion, that's going to be, uh, you know, generally we show the articles, we show videos if if applicable, and just, you know, hey, a little visual component to what it is uh, that, you know, we kind of do here. But for everyone just listening, hey, it's, it's going to be okay. We promise. So, Ralph, with that <laughs> being said, let's go ahead and get started with story number one. You bet. Well, the headline here, and this comes from MIT News, Engineering Household Robots to Have a Little Common Sense. And the subtitle, with help from a large language model, MIT engineers enabled robots to self-correct after missteps and carry on with their chores. So you can tell right away the essence here is instead of just a robotic, no pun intended, replication of motions over and over again, it's what happens if you're disrupted? What happens if the robot is interrupted? Can it correct itself? And the MIT team thinks they've come up with a solution. So this is really a fun story. Very and Ben cool. mentioned the show notes. Ben mentioned the show notes, mentioned that referencing kind of like Cliff Notes, it's a very good comparison because what we do is highlight the key points from the four articles we're going to illustrate today. So please come out to ComputerAmerica.com and get those show notes if you want to dig deeper, read the full articles, and see all the illustrations as well. So here we go from the start at the beginning of the article here. It says, from wiping up spills to serving up food, robots are being taught to carry out increasingly complex complicated, pardon me, household tasks. Many such 
Homebot trainees are learning through imitation. They are programmed to copy the motions that a human physically guides them through. It turns out that robots, of course, we all know this, are excellent mimics. But unless engineers also program them to adjust to every possible bump and nudge, meaning interruptions, robots don't necessarily know how to handle these situations, short of starting the task from the top or starting all over again. Mm -hmm. So, so now, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Engineers are aiming to give robots a bit of common sense when faced with situations that push them off their trained path. They've developed a method that connects robot motion data with the common sense knowledge of large language models, or the acronym LLMs. And I'm going to segue here just for a moment. This is one of the things we do in the show notes, folks, when I gather these articles and condense them into the highlight points. Sometimes I add a little tutorial element to it, and this is what we're doing right here in the show notes. Side note, wait a minute, what are large language models? You're going to hear more and more and more about this as the world becomes more um, impacted by artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So a large language model is a category of foundation models trained on immense amounts of data, enabling them to understand and generate natural language, and other types of content for a wide range of tasks. So LLMs, Ben, <laughs> they're just so important for what we're doing in artificial intelligence these days. Yeah, the, it, it's and, and from my understanding, it's uh, kind of like a big old soup, and it can, <laughs> and, and, and just artificial intelligence takes it beyond just word association where you say cat, it'll say, you know, dog and say other animals. It will, you know, even though it's a large language model, they're fed so much data, and you're talking like the entirety of you know, um, you know, like the entirety of Reddit, the entirety of Twitter, the entirety of uh, movies yeah. and songs and art and just the entirety of everything. And this soup will, you give it one thing and it'll start just connecting it like a bunch of nodes. Yeah. And then that will, of course, yeah. let it branch out and not just speak like a human, but also do things like a human. It, it, yeah. It's actually very like foundational to all the excitement that AI has gotten in the past like couple of years. And it's really hard in a way to wrap your head around. It's like trying to wrap your head around the enormity of the of the galaxy of the. Yeah, <laughs> no, like, yeah. I, I mean, it's it, it's like trying to understand, you know, like a processor. It, it's all inanimate objects, but it can do all these calculations so so fast. Like, and, and I, I know, you know I'm talking to you, so you probably know more about processors than I you know, probably ever will. But it's it's just it's really incredible and why AI is not just like, you know, a buzzword. It's an actual technology that's really changing, you know, so much. But, oh yeah. But please continue. Yeah. yeah. And then Ben, to kind of illustrate further the enormity of uh, large language models, a little more data here. These models are designed to understand. That's a key word designed to understand and generate text like a human infer context provide coherent responses, translate languages, summarize text, answer questions, and even assist in creative writing or code generation tasks. That's just, that one paragraph is just so mind-boggling. And the whole thing about creative writing, et cetera, is, of course, why the artistic community is up in arms about AI. But that's another topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's again, this idea of a soup where you just start with something and it kind of branches out and out and out. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not actually stringing things together. It's more like, well, likely we'll do this and this and this. And it's like kind of the likeliness. Yeah. Which, Ralph, which is why data has become such a big thing, because uh, it can really only connect things that are connected already for it in the data sets that it has. Um, and the more data, the more right. complex the connections get. So, yeah, data is, uh, you know, and, and, you know, the systems are going to get larger and larger and more complex and therefore better. So look forward to that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So now with all of that background mm -hmm. kind of established. Here's how MIT is working to give robots a bit of what they call common sense. MIT's approach enables a robot to logically parse many given household tasks into subtasks and to physically adjust to disruptions within a subtask 
so that the robot can move on without having to go back and start a task from scratch or from the beginning. And, and here's a key, and without engineers having to explicitly program fixes for every possible failure along the way. Wow, That'll save time. let that sink in. Yeah. yeah, it's just a stunning achievement in terms of uh, uh, program, if you will. So a graduate student in MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science noted, quote, with our method, a robot can self-correct execution errors and improve overall task success. So it's this self-correcting part of it. Again, I want to stress, in robotics, historically, it's been... You train the robot to pick up the box, go over here and put it in the shelf, and then pick up the box, the next box, and do it over and over and over again. Very. But what happens if somebody bumps into the robot and they're pushed off their track? It, most of the time in robotics, it, it means, oh, I'll go back and just start over again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're talking about giving it common sense or giving it the ability to deal with unforeseen problems again without having to reprogram or without having to have a human intervene that's the key part here and to illustrate their new approach the mi team selected a simple chore which the little video you're seeing on the screen if you're watching our our program on youtube you can see what's going on so they selected a simple task scooping marbles from one bowl and pouring them into another. To accomplish this task, engineers would typically move a robot through the motions of scooping and pouring all in one fluid trajectory. They might do this multiple times to give the robot a number of human demonstrations to mimic, to imitate. Well, the team then let the robot carry out the scooping task on its own. As the robot moved through the steps of the task, the experimenters pushed and nudged the robot off its path and knocked marbles off its spoon at various points. So there's your disruption. Rather than stop and start from the beginning again or continue blindly with no marbles on its spoon, the robot was able to self-correct and completed each subtask before moving on to the next. For instance, it would make sure that it successfully scooped marbles before transporting them to the empty bowl. Wow. So this is a big step forward in many ways. You can see again in the video, there they are. They're messing with the robot, jiggling right. its arm. <laughs> and the robot's like a human is going, okay, okay, I can deal with this. I'll just adjust and continue on. <laughs> yeah. And and it's it's slightly different from other examples that we've seen. Like, Ralph, I'm sure that we talked about, let's say like when, when robots, they the programmers say, okay, robot, learn to walk. And like you see like those, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, hundred different instances where the right. robot robots trying to walk and it eventually uh, creates the best way for it to look mode, you know, in like a simulation or something like that. Right. So, uh, but that's like learning to do a task. This yes. is on the fly adjusting an existing task that it knows it needs to do. It's, uh, yeah. you know, very, this is like, if you were a manager at a, at an Amazon warehouse, you were, you would mm -hmm. be like, this mm -hmm. is what I need. Mm -hmm. This is perfect for, you know, simple repetitive tasks that have a lot of like little nuances and can have like a lot of little variability. Um, this is like, this kind of research is really going to have a huge impact on robots, you know, and, and how well they can cope, which, right. uh, you know, Ralph, like when you think robots, you don't think, oh, they're adaptive. No, that's like the opposite of robotics, but. There you go. It. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a great... W I love what you just said. You think of uh, a robots as repetitive and so forth. You never think of the word uh, on-the-fly adaptation. Mm -hmm. And this is what MIT is working on. It just is, again, another important step forward in robotics. I love for, it. For sure. And, <laughs> and, and, and I especially love that they're kind of focusing on, like, in-the-home robots, which kind of makes me wonder, Ralph, like, I know we have, like, the Roombas. I wonder what <laughs> other robots are going to be on our homes in five years. You know, it's... Uh, uh, Ben, I think what I see in, in the readings that I do and looking at all these articles across so many resources, in the field of, of home robotics, a lot of people are talking about elder care. Mm -hmm. This is where you know p patients or people who are reaching a point where mobility is a problem for them, where fixing their own food is a problem for them. Someday in the future, we could have bots that will be not only uh, helpful assistants, but even kind of companions for shut-in elderly, even in even if they live in uh, retirement home communities and that sort of thing, there's a terrible need for this and a terrible shortage of 
humans to do this work. Maybe someday we could make it affordable and possible and adaptable Absolutely. enough to do that kind of work. So that's where a lot of this home robotics field is kind of looking at elder care. Yeah, for, from a lot <laughs> Not exclusively. of exclusively. Yeah, for, from what we've been seeing, I, I I definitely agree with you. And you know, fingers crossed, robots like this and stories like this uh, make it so that maybe in the future I never have to do dishes again because I love to cook. I hate to do dishes, <laughs> and you know, yeah. something like this would be great for you know for things like that. <laughs> So yes. there you go. Story number one. Very cool. If you want to check out the videos or anything like that that you missed, ComputerAmerica.com. Story number two. Let's go ahead and jump into uh, Intel, which, you know, yes. um, they've they've been around a little while. And yes. this, uh, this is, again, AI-centric. Um, let's talk about yes. and, and, you know, it's... Uh, I was giving a very bad uh, explanation of AI before, <laughs> but it's the best one I have. Um, and... <laughs> All in all, it's trying to get computers to, you know, at least artificially be intelligent, artificial intelligence. Uh, looks like Intel is, you know, evolving that a little bit further and trying to mimic the human brain, which is uh, deceptively, you know, d despite the way I see people drive, Ralph, uh, the human brain is amazing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess they're trying to get uh, chips to act more like the human brain. So let's talk about Intel. Yeah, ex Exactly. This, is, again, is another great installment in the onward march of artificial intelligence. The headline here is Intel unveils largest ever AI neuromorphic computer, we'll explain that, that mimics the human brain. And a little commentary here before we move on. As you know, I worked for uh, Intel for many, many mm -hmm. years. And um, of the last, say, five or six years, there, there was kind of this vibe in the press about Intel's behind the curve. Other people are getting ahead of them. Uh, they're, they've kind of gotten stuck in their old ways. They're not adapting. Time out. I think especially with Pat uh, Gelsinger at the helm, we're really moving the company forward in a very aggressive way. And so here we are, Intel and Bell's largest ever AI neuromorphic computer that very mimics cool. the human brain. By the way, this story comes from LiveScience.com, a great resource. Uh, check that out if you have the show notes. So let's get into this. So scientists at Intel have built the world's largest neuromorphic computer. That, that means one designed and structured to mimic the human brain. This is a big area of AI and computing and so forth, as you know, Ben, right now. And the company hopes it will support future artificial intelligence research. Now, a little side note here, because neuromorphic is a term like large language models, and there's certain buzzwords and terms and things going on in artificial intelligence. If you're interested in this field, you need to get hip to this. So neuromorphic engineering is an interdisciplinary field that draws inspiration from biology, physics, mathematics, computer science, and electronic engineering. And it aims to design artificial neural systems based on the structure and functioning of the human brain and nervous system. That's a key point there, human brain and nervous system. It's a really big thing to grab, you know, put your brain around. It. Well, it, you know, put your brain around yeah. it, but at the same time, it's a computer that thinks like you do. So, you know, it should be pretty similar, but it's it's hard to imagine that they can actually pull something like that off. But uh, yeah, so, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. And Intel's machine, dubbed or called HALA, that's H-A-L-A point, can perform AI workloads 50 times faster and use 100 times less energy than conventional computing systems that use CPU, central processing units, and or graphics processing units like NVIDIA, you think of them, uh, Intel said in a statement, so 50 times faster and using 100 times less energy than conventional today's AI-based systems that use CPUs or GPUs, right? Mm -hmm. And HalaPoint will initially be deployed at the Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico, where scientists will use it to tackle problems in device physics, computing architecture, and computing science. So it's going to be put right into the research field, which I think is kind of interesting as well. And here's some factoids. You're going to love this, Ben. <laughs> Let's get ready. Powered by 1,152 of Intel's new Loihai, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, two, Loihai 2, the number two, processors, a neuromorphic research chip, emphasis research chip, 
This large-scale system comprises 1.15 billion artificial neurons and 128 billion artificial synapses distributed over 140,544 processing cores. What? It's it's uh, and you know my my brain immediately tries to you know kind of be like well you know I have a you know I have an i seven or an i nine that does you know has this many cores uh, not applicable whatsoever these processors are clearly you know not designed like your you know like your desktop or your no. laptop processor no yeah. no that's a good point Ben and we're going to find out even more to your point mm-hmm. how this is not like your uh, mom or dad's processor in the, right. or computer system setup. It's a different deal. By the way, it mentions here 128 billion artificial synapses. Well, well, synapses are crucial junctions in the nervous system where neurons, nerve cells, communicate with each other or with target cells like muscles or glands. So I thought maybe everybody doesn't immediately know what a synapse is. So there's mm-hmm. a little explanation for you. So back to the story here. Holopoint, this new system, can make 20 quadrillion operations per second 20 quadrillion operations per second side note intel chose the name loihi for its neuromorphic research processor with a purpose the name loihi is inspired by the loihi seamount an underwater volcano located off the coast of hawaii and i have in the show notes we're not going to go through this on air here uh an optional bit in the side notes very interesting information from intel as to why they chose this name and you can go and check that out in the show notes come to computeramerica.com and you can learn about that history which i think is kind of fun but back to the key point here let's put 20 quadrillion operations per second into perspective In numerical terms, a quadrillion is equivalent to one million million. It's what I don't know if that really puts it into perspective, but you know, it's um, so you have 20, 20, 1 million millions operations per second. What? gosh <laughs> it, that's uh let's see it was that three six nine twelve <laughs> it's 15 zeros 15, i think 18 or no, no, I'm, I'm sorry you're right 15 zeros is quadrillion 18 is quintillion that's right so yeah there you go 15 zeros <laughs> it's and, and i i guess like they were talking about you know kind of synapses and operations and that kind of thing yeah like for yes. you know your at-home processor you know yeah you're talking <laughs> like in the in like the giga uh, amounts and they're talking like peta like another order of magnitude yes greater yes it's, it's really insane and by the way 100 percent of the budget went to research zero percent of the budget went to uh to aesthetic design and marketability because this thing <laughs> just looks like a giant yeah. server rack really it does doesn't it yeah mm-hmm. i thought that too when i looked at the illustrations and the photos of this thing so now let's go back you mentioned a point that this is not like your normal architecture for a system you're quite right because in classical computing binary bits of ones and zeros flow into hardware like a cpu or gpu or memory before processing calculations in sequence and spitting out a binary input that's been the classic computer model for decades right mm-hmm. Well, warning, I'm going to warn you up front here. The following is super geeky, folks, and I don't profess to fully get it myself, but I do want to strike, you know, put this into your minds because they're going to talk about something called spike input. Anyway, here we go. In neuromorphic computing, however, a spike input, which is a set of discrete electrical signals, is fed into the spiking neural networks represented by the processors. Oh, wow. Already I feel lost. Where software-based neural networks are a collection of machine learning algorithms arranged to mimic the human brain, spiking neural networks are a physical embodiment of how that information is transmitted. It allows for parallel processing and spike outputs are measured following calculations. Like the brain, Holopoint and the Loihi 2 processors use spiking neural networks where different nodes are connected and information is processed at different layers similar to neurons in the brain. The chips also integrate. Oh, here's a key point, Ben. The chips also integrate memory and computing power in one place. Hmm. Now, think about your, your laptop or your desktop or even your phone or whatever. The processor is a separate thing. 
And memory is a separate thing. Now, they work together to process instructions mm -hmm. and output, and output, output. <laughs> but the chips here in this system integrate memory and computing power in one place. So in conventional computers, as I just said, processing power and memory are separated. This creates a bottleneck as data must physically travel between those components. Integrating, in contrast, what Intel's up to, integrating memory and computing power enables parallel processing and reduces power consumption in this amazing neuromorphic AI system Intel has come up with. So congratulations to Pat Gelsinger and team for pulling this off. And it's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's and and whenever uh, people hear that, you know, it, it uses less power, it's not that they want to save on the electric bill. Uh, in a lot of cases, whenever you hear less power, it means they can yeah. use more electricity so they can power more things. And like the heat is less. So you don't have to like, you know, super cool these things down to like negative, you know, 100 degrees uh, yeah. Celsius or something like that. Uh, it, it just yeah. means that they can get even more uh, efficiency out of their system whenever they reduce yeah. heat and efficiency. So, or it, yeah. I should say increase efficiency. So very cool, uh, very confusing at the same time, but <laughs> yes. all in all, like this kind of technology, Ralph, like a couple of years ago, it was quantum computing and we had Intel on the show to explain that to us. Uh, might have to have Intel on the show to explain what uh, spiking neural networks are and, and, and what uh, oh, yeah. uh, Loy he might be in hollow point, but still it's uh, makes you wonder like, these things, like this is not going to make your game run faster. This is not going to make your emails, you know, well, well it might write your emails for you, but uh, <laughs> Ralph, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, what is this kind of for? Is this for AI and robots, which I think you said at the beginning it kind of was, uh, well, you know, it just makes computers act more like the human brain, but like quantum computers, great for like weather prediction, typical computers, great for image output. Um, this computer, who knows, but I'm sure it will have yeah. an amazing application, so... Well, and to your point, Ben, as the as the story mentions, that the Intel's going to turn over their first system to the Sandia Labs for research oh, purposes. So, right, that's oh, uh, it, yeah. it'll be so interesting to track that. I mean, keep your eye on what Sandia does, and maybe down the road, Sandia may have some. Uh, the labs may have some announcements as to mm -hmm. with this system we have now been able to do blah blah blah, and we'll find out what they're up to. <laughs> yeah, and and um, still very very cool. And there you go, story yeah. number two. Uh, always great to hear from Intel. And story yes. number three. Let's go ahead and talk about well batteries, and we've heard of. Um, self-healing concrete and self-healing so many other things yes batteries though ralph the, it's it's one of those where like if you puncture a battery i think everyone can remember the s20 um you know from from samsung where yes. it kind of had this uh, <laughs> propensity to explode i guess would be a good way to put it um yeah batteries are important healthy batteries are super important let's talk about story number three yeah, story number three has lots of layers to it relative to the world of batteries and where we're going. So headline here is scientists develop new material that can allow rechargeable batteries to self-heal. Subtitle, the new cathode material for lithium sulfur batteries is healable and highly conductive. Hmm. Wow, there's a lot going on in this story, even just in that headline and subhead. So this comes from The Cooldown, which is a really interesting resource. Uh, I also have some other uh, references you can check out in the show notes as well. But first, before we get into this, we need to set the stage with some battery basics. In the context of batteries, electrodes play a crucial or critical role in facilitating chemical reactions that generate electrical energy. For example, the cathode and anode in a battery are both types of electrodes. The cathode accepts electrons while the anode releases them. But remember, both are electrodes. Now, what we're going to be talking about in this news and in this story uh, is the development of a lithium sulfur cathode. Again, it's an electrode with self-healing properties. What? Wow. Okay, and now for the news. <laughs> the author here talked about the self healing and equated it to Wolverine, the Marvel comic mm -hmm. character. I think that's Marvel, right? Yep. Anyway, the battery cat, the uh, battery cathode in development in labs at the University of California, San Diego, has Wolverine like self healing properties. And I couldn't resist inserting a little comic of uh, Wolverine there. <laughs> right. 
The regenerative ability of the newly developed lithium sulfur electrode could help to unlock chemistry that doubles electric vehicle range. Wow, doubles. According to experts, it's a promising breakthrough with fascinating potential, as the author of this article points out. Now, lithium sulfur battery tech is already being developed in other labs, so it's not that itself is not new offering a clean, lightweight, and lower-cost alternative to common lithium-ion batteries. So we're talking about lithium sulfur batteries, a different take than lithium-ion, yeah, okay? And, and, and in the sh- and yeah. like you said, real quick, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are familiar, are, are familiar with lithium-ion batteries. <laughs> um, yes. And I, I guess a lot of the research that we've covered here on the show has been lithium uh, I think it's like lithium salt battery, like salt batteries. Uh, yes, lithium, sodium. Yes, sodium yes. batteries. Yep. Uh, yep. So this is a this one is new to me. So sulfur, neat. neat. Yeah, this is it's really interesting. And in the show notes, again, come out to computeramerica.com, get these show notes, because if you want to go, you wait, lithium sulfur batteries, what the heck is that all about? I've got a link to a great tutorial article about that that I inserted into the show notes uh, for your uh, education. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the UC San Diego experts take it to another level. Uh, again, there's been research in lithium sulfur batteries that that's not new, but what they're doing at the UC University of California, San Diego, they're taking it to another level as compared to other research and development to date on lithium sulfur batteries. So what they're doing is with the sulfur cathode they developed that has a rejuvenation ability seemingly fit for the Marvel Universe. Again, another little fun reference to Wolverine. So here's the problem. We all, I think most of us know this. Cathodes in today's lithium ion batteries suffer structural damage, which accumulates during operation. So they deteriorate. We all know that. Eventually, my RAV4 Prime plug-in hybrid, I'm going to someday have to get a new battery for it. I mean, I know it's coming. But to tackle this problem, the team made a cathode crystal crystal, pardon me, from sulfur and iodine. Hmm. Hmm. In addition to self-healing of the new cathode, more on that in a moment, the iodine molecules have great impact, increasing connectivity by 11 orders of magnitude, making it, get ready, making it 100 billion times more conductive than crystals made of sulfur alone, per the lab report. That's the role of combining sulfur with the iodine. Uh, This is geeky, folks. This Mm -hmm. is geeky stuff. So bear with us. One of the researchers noted the drastic increase in electrical connectivity in sulfur is a surprise and scientifically very interesting, to say the least. Now, Here's more on the self-healing part of this discovery. So the article goes on to say, furthermore, the newly developed cathode material can melt at low temperature, about 149 degrees Fahrenheit, at what the UC San Diego team likens to a cup of hot coffee. And the low melting point allows the cathode to essentially heal damage during operation. Huh. Let that sink in. Isn't that something? (laughs) Wow. And one of the co-authors of the study noted, quote, iodine disrupts the intermolecular bonds holding sulfur molecules together by just the right amount to lower its melting point to above room temperature, yet low enough for the cathode to be periodically rehealed via melting. Uh, Wow. It's science that has great implications for battery longevity, as to say the least, and to wrap it up here, a test battery they created maintained 87% capacity after 400 cycles. And the experts said this type of power pack can hold double the energy of lithium ion batteries. And that corresponds to twice the range for EVs, the researchers report. So a great step forward. And by the way, you're right to mention salt batteries a moment ago. Mm-hmm. Just this week, I, I might do a story on it uh, in a future show. Uh, a big breakthrough in, in making salt batteries uh, a viable alternative to lithium ion. And of course, sodium is pretty uh, inexpensive and pretty readily accessible. <laughs> For sure. And and, and I, I was just kind of curious what, uh, what lithium ion uh, cycle life is, you know, because I kind of throw up 400 cycles here mm. for 87% capacity. Uh, looks yeah. like, um, you know, most lithium ion batteries have a cycle of around or life span of about 500 cycles. So it's, you know, it's already pretty competitive with uh, what is typical with lithium ion. And Ralph, like that's super important because 
it can't mm-hmm. really have any drawbacks because li- lithium ion is such a known technology and so embedded in everything that we do. Right. Like it, it needs to be as rechargeable. It needs to be as long lasting. It needs to be uh, hopefully more energy dense. Like it needs to be so much better because we're so we're so all in on lithium ion that uh, it's yeah. going to take something yeah. like that to really, you know, yeah, get it out of there. So very yeah. cool. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah, and, cool and, stuff. And just the idea that <laughs> you know, just it can essentially reheal itself by raising the temperature to normal yes. operating temperatures and that alone just you know through the operation actually reheals those crystals you know uh, kind of turns them back into uh i know, you know melts them so very very cool oh yeah uh if you want to find out more which i guarantee you there's a lot more to this uh yes yeah, yes uh story number four let's uh let's go ahead and switch it up a little bit uh you know a lot of high-tech stuff and uh i say switch <laughs> it up this one's also high-tech uh, but this one's medical, and uh, Ralph has yes. a special, uh, you know, special place in his heart, and of course, in our stories <laughs> for medical technology. So you got Ralph, it. story number four. Yeah, story number four. Again, to Ben's point, often if you're new to the show, we often end the segment with something from medical technology, which is just uh, talk about leaving you feeling good. Mm-hmm. Check this headline out. This comes from interestingengineering.com. Headline, engineer plans solar panel implant for human retina to retain eyesight? How could I resist? (laughs) Well, I couldn't. Freaky. (laughs) Yeah, it's very freaky, but very cool. So, researchers at the University of New New South Wales in Australia are working on a new prototype. Emphasis prototype, folks. Well, we talk about our trends So we're talking about early research. So they're working on a prototype device that can be implanted on the eye's retina to restore sight. Wow. The device uses solar panels. Now that wink and nod a little bit on that one. The device uses solar panels like those used to convert sunlight into electricity, a university press release said. What they're saying is that it uses the essential properties Mm -hmm. uh, functionality of a solar panel, but used for a different purpose. So let's be clear about that. Now, while the prosthesis, if I can say that, (laughs) replaces a missing or non-functional part of the body, neuroprosthesis is a relatively new field where the prosthetic device interacts with the neural system to restore a lost functionality. So we're talking about a neuroprosthesis for the human eye. And that field of neuroprosthesis, as you know, Ben, from our many shows over the last several years, is such an important field in medical technology and so exciting and really it's just it's, great. And yeah, by, it, yeah it, go it's ahead. one thing to replace, you know, uh, to mm-hmm. uh, have a prosthesis for a missing leg. It's another thing to have mm-hmm. a neuroprosthesis to, you know, maybe make that leg function or, you know, in this case, eyesight or hearing or, you know, one of the more complicated brain thing so yeah oh yeah 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 great example we're going to talk about cochlear implants is a good example but your comment your your comment just made me think about this there's so much work in say forearm or hand replacements Mm -hmm. uh that can touch that can feel temperature that's neuroprosthesis it's going beyond just a mechanical attachment where where i can think grasp i can think release you have to hook it up to my nervous system to do that that's neuroprosthesis and Mm -hmm. again the article does a good job in helping to explain this further by saying cochlear ear implants are a good example of neuroprosthesis the in individuals with severe hearing loss the implant converts sound into electrical signals that are then used to stimulate the auditory nerve restoring hearing okay so now According to an engineer with expertise in photovoltaics at the University of New South Wales in Australia, a similar approach could be used for vision loss. Quote, people with certain diseases like retinitis pigmentosa and age-related macular degeneration slowly lose their eyesight as photoreceptors at the center of the eye degenerate. I've got something they call floaters. Oh, it's just great getting old, Ben. Let me tell you. I, I, I have like I, these. I have, uh, I have dealt with uh, my parents who, you know, almost can't even drive anymore because of the amount of floaters. Uh, like, and I've heard that they're, you can get like this operation where they shoot lasers into your eyes and kind of break them up so you kind of do the thing. But also kind of dangerous and uh, not yeah. fun. So, no, yeah. no. Yeah, so... 
I can really relate to this story in mm-hmm. some respects. So the research team is using the same concept as cochlear implants to treat vision loss with neuroprosthesis. So for patients who have damaged photoreceptors, the prosthesis they're working on has to bypass them, bypass the natural photoreceptors in your eye, and bypass them and convert light entering the eye into electrical signals. These can then be directed to the optic nerve, enabling vision. And this just absolutely blows my mind. Mm -hmm. To date, uh, and to put it into context here, to date, related research efforts have tried to create new photoreceptor cells. So they've been trying to make you know replacement cells, which involved experiments with electrodes that create a voltage pulse. While this works in principle, these systems, that, that system approach rather, requires wires to go into the eye, eek, making it a complicated procedure. Trust me, my, my buddy across the street just had cardiac, you know, uh, surgery and stuff. And I just said, I can't imagine somebody sticking something. Ooh, I just, <laughs> I, that's, that's one of my pet fee or fears. I just can't handle it. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, I had laser eye surgery not too long ago. It's, mm, uh, it, mm. it's definitely a weird, you know, kind of feeling where they kind of like reshape your corner or they, they peel back the top layer yeah. of your eye and like <clears throat> everything kind of gets blurry. Like they have like, uh, they yeah. numb it, Ralph. It's like everything's clear and or you know clearish because it, my eyesight wasn't fixed. They pull back you know the top layer of the eye, they reshape the cornea, and then they you know kind of peel it back over and they kind of smooth it out, and everything just goes clear like suddenly. And it's it's wow. it's a weird feeling because they are you know essentially touching your eye. Um, but but yeah, you know, being uh, having that system that they were just talking about versus you know yeah. this new solar panel on the eyeball. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I Ralph, it sounds like. Research before was like, okay, we know how the eyeball works. Let's try to recreate that uh, as best we can and, you know, kind of restore the functionality. This is like bypassing a lot of the eye. Exactly. Giving a certain amount of of, of restored vision. So um, Exactly right. Both have a place, but still very cool that, you know, both can exist. Yeah. So again, to your point, the goal here is to find a no wires alternative. And a university of uh, the University of New South Wales multidisciplinary team of researcher that includes, by the way, engineers, neuroscientists, and biotech experts, and they're working on achieving this with the help of solar panels. Huh? The idea involves using, of course, tiny solar panel attached to the eyeball and converting incoming light into an electrical impulse sent to the brain. And you're going to love this. The major advantage of using solar panels. And what they really mean is the essential technology of solar panels. Okay, please don't think about the big black things that are on the roof (laughs) of your house. Okay, a major advantage of using solar panels instead of electrodes that require the wires going into your eyes. Eek. So the big advantage of solar panels instead of electrodes is that the device can be self-powered. Wow. And does not require any wires to be attached to the eye. Hmm. Now, qualifier, this isn't the first time the idea has been experimented on. But the University of New South Wales team has taken a slightly different path toward achieving it. While solar panels are typically made of abundantly available silicon, the team has turned to alternative semiconductor materials such as gallium arsenide and gallium indium phosphide to develop their solar panels for the eye. Although more expensive than silicon, these materials are easier to work with and their properties can be quickly modified to suit the application. Huh. And to wrap this up here, to be ready for human implementation, the device must cover an area of two square millimeters with each pixel measuring 50 micrometers. The University of New South Wales team added in a press release that users might wear special glasses or goggles that amplify sunlight to an intensity that can stimulate neurons in the eye. So again, early research, they're not saying this is you know ready for deployment, but a very curious uh, advancement. And salute to the Australians. These men and women down there are doing such amazing stuff in solar energy across the board, mm-hmm. including this bizarre and fascinating use of creating little solar panels <laughs> for the retina of the eye. Go figure. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely makes you a bit squeamish, you know, just kind of considering it. But but for yes. those who but for those who can't see, you know, I'm I'm sure that research like this is uh, is always. Um, you know, potentially hopeful that there may be yeah. a solution. And I'm sure that even at these levels, if they were to get it to work, 
Ralph, I mean, yeah. like, there's a big difference. Like, even if you can't use, uh, let's say you have complete vision loss, Ralph, I'm sure even just, you know, light versus dark, you know, is a room light, is it dark, is it day, is it night? Yeah. Like, even just yeah. that basic level of, of being able to see would be a huge benefit to people. So, uh, absolutely. It, it's, uh, you know, it'll get there. And just miniaturization, which a lot of today's stories have been about these new technologies we've been hearing about but everything's just incrementally better you know better battery better ai better you know processors better 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 yeah and that is uh you know that's a great you know chunk of these stories and that's always yeah very very uh Mm -hmm. not enlightening but uh enheartening i guess maybe a word yes it, encouraging encouraging there we go that's a word uh yeah have not had all my coffee yet so i apologize okay so there you go uh ladies and gentlemen if you can keep in count at home that is four stories but you may yep. be like hey ben there's other stuff down here well ralph let's tell them about the honorable mentions yeah so what i do there's so many stories like ben often says on the show these are stories that that didn't make it into the show because they're not good enough. No, heavens no, we just don't have time. And believe me, I could put hundreds of stories <laughs> in each episode, but we don't have time for that. But what we do with honorable mentions is just highlight a few things that caught my eye. This first story relates very well to that MIT story about common sense for robots. Uh, this is related. So if you're interested in this field, you want to check this article out from PC Magazine. Headline, AI scientists create humanoid robot that thinks its way through tasks. So it's very closely related to what the MIT folks are doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Check that out. It's very interesting from a startup company. And the next headline here, new story from Mashable.com, the United States is exploring a railroad for the moon. Okay. If it's if it's anything like the new railroads I've heard I've heard you know like up and down the east coast and from yes. you know like Dallas to Colorado, um, yeah, that's going to be uh, ten years behind schedule and ten billion dollars behind budget. So uh, we'll see, yep. we'll see. Yeah, yeah. And then this story is another Intel story. Okay, I couldn't resist because I'm an Intel alum mm-hmm. and I have a very warm spot in my heart for my years there. Uh, and again, this is another story, Ben, that reflects on if you think Intel's a sleepy at the wheel beast that's stuck in the past, think again. Headline, and this comes from our local newspaper, The Oregonian Intel bets its future on exotic, expensive tool that shoots lasers hotter than the sun. Subtitle Late to the last generation of manufacturing technology, Intel wants to be out in front on the next. Great subtitle because that really captures what, again, Pat Gelsinger and team are all about, mm-hmm. moving the company forward. Please check that story out. It's a, If you're into manufacturing uh, of, of processors and so forth, you've got to check this thing out. It's a fascinating piece of equipment, and they've got it, in fact, very close to where I live, so it's very cool. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and really just the picture alone, uh, which uh, I can actually yeah. show up there. It, it's like I, I've seen a lot of like manufacturing. This is like nothing I've ever seen. It's yeah, um, and that's something. They, yeah, they, they're <laughs> they're doing something crazy over there. And uh, after just watching Fallout, the, the TV show, and kind oh, of oh yes, I am watching it too. <laughs> yeah, and just kind of seeing like the post apocalyptic, you know, <laughs> you know, kind of corporate <laughs> yeah. overlords. Um, yes. you know, it draws, it, it, it draws a parallel, but I'm sure they're doing good things with this. So, yeah. And, <laughs> yes, and then hopefully. there's one more, uh, honorable mention. Yes. And the last one here, uh, another trend headline from MSN, a story, actually a story from gadget headline, hydrogen cars set new range records. So you want to check that out if you're just in the field of hydrogen cars, which keeps marching on despite a lot of people thinking, eh, it's too hard to implement, too hard this, too hard that. Mm. Nope, they're still working on it. They're still going to push it forward. And I think it'll find its way into the mix of our transportation future. For sure. Hydrogen is here to stay and electric vehicles are here to stay (laughs) despite so much of the news. But ladies and gentlemen, Hey, that's all the news we have for you here today. And I want to thank Ralph for joining us and bringing us these stories. As always, he did an amazing job on the show notes and amazing job uh, picking these stories. You know, uh, they're, they're always a lot of fun. And all of these stories, if you want to find out more, ComputerAmerica.com will have all the links. If you're like, no way, Ralph's making that up. Uh, I promise you, you know, hey, he's not. And uh, we'll have all those available on our site. So, Ralph, until next time, I want to thank you so much. And everyone else out there, thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you here. Everyone, ComputerAmerica.com. See you next time. Bye, everyone.